Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahni sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Can everybody hear me? If you can, please type in yes into the chat screen. Um, can you also see the slides and can you also see uh, my video? If you can, please type in yes. Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, so welcome to session three, discussing the life of the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam. We have three sessions left in this series and there's a lot of information to cover. So let's have a look at um, some of the uh, lessons that we learnt from last week. So before we go into the lessons from last week, um, let me ask the students, uh, what can you remember from last week? What were some of the lessons that we learnt from last week? What did we what what did we learn about last week? Okay, so we mentioned last week uh, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam growing up as a young boy. Um, he was growing up in a community where the people they worshipped idols, and he had a discussion with his father growing up as a young child. We mentioned the respect and honor Ibrahim alayhi salam had for his father. And then we also mentioned that Allah Azza wa Jal, at such a young age, he blessed Ibrahim with a rushda, okay, with sound judgment, sound guidance from a very young age. Um, we talked about being kind to your parents, um, even if they ask you to turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mentioned this is a verse in the Quran that even if your parents, they ask you to turn away from Allah, you need to address them in kindness. Uh, if they um, instruct you to turn away from Allah, you do not listen to them, but you still have to be kind and courteous to them. Um, one very important point, uh, bullet point number three, we also learned uh, that we need to be people who understand the teachings of Islam uh, who appreciate uh, the teachings of Islam and we shouldn't be people who are Muslim just by choice. Uh, I remember the example I gave you guys last week regarding uh, the car, the picture of the car, the Lamborghini, and I said it's a red Lamborghini and many of you guys pointed out in the class that it's Sheikh um, or Imam, it's a green uh, Lamborghini that we're looking at. So this is the, the same argument that Ibrahim bought against his people. Why are you worshipping idols? And they said, because we found our forefathers worshipping them. So we don't want to be people who are worshipping Allah um, because our forefathers did it. Rather, we want to be people who have sound knowledge, uh, wisdom, uh, and we worship Allah because we understand the reason why we are worshipping Allah as our creator. Uh, we mentioned the breaking of idols was a case only for Ibrahim alayhi salam against his people. Okay, so this was an argument that Allah had given Ibrahim alayhi salam against his people. We mentioned that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah mentions that he is an ummah. Okay, he is an ummah, he is a leader. The um, iman, the faith of Ibrahim alayhi salam was equi equivalent to the faith of an ummah because in that time in the society, uh, in the time of ignorance and jahiliyyah, where people were worshipping idols, there was only Ibrahim who stood up in society against the people and uh, standing up for uh, the argument to worship one Allah alone without any partners. And then we mentioned the argument of Ibrahim alayhi salam with the king, uh, that Ibrahim again was given a sound judgment, sound reasoning from such a young age. Uh, the king brought uh, some arguments forward um, in response to Ibrahim alayhi salam saying that my Lord is the one who gives life and death and he said I can give life and death as well and he set one prisoner free and he killed the other one. Ibrahim alayhi salam he didn't respond to this argument rather he brought a different argument forward and he said my Lord is the one who makes the sun rise from the east let me see you make it rise from the west and we see in response to this um, uh, King Nimrod did not have any um, arguments to counter Ibrahim alayhi salam and he was defeated. And then finally, 
uh, we started to talk about the three categories of Tawheed. Uh, we mentioned that Tawheed is the fundamental uh, first pillar of Islam. And at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the categorization of Tawheed into the three categories uh, was not done. And this was because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the teacher at that time. Okay, he taught the Sahaba. So a question for the class, um, what are the three categories? What are the three categories of Tawheed? We mentioned them last week. Can anybody remember? Okay, we have Tawheed al rububiya We have Asma wa Sifat. That's two of them. And Tawheed al-Ibadah. Very good, mashaAllah. Okay, so let's uh, recap. What is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah about? What is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah? We mentioned it last week. Um, does anybody have any ideas? We covered two out of the three categories of Tawheed last week. Unity of Allah's Lordship which basically means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, he is the sustainer, and Allah is the one who created everything in the universe. Okay, we turn to him uh, alone in worship, and if we, can, if we support somebody or we provide assistance to someone, uh, we will only be able to provide assistance to someone by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, what about the second point? Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat. Okay. Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat. This was somebody mentioned names and attributes of Allah. So we mentioned a number of points about the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. We talked about um, the, um, using the Quran and Sunnah as evidence for any way in which we worship Allah. Okay. So if um, uh, Allah has given Himself a name, we can call him with that name. If Allah um, is one who punishes, but he has not given himself the name, the punisher, then we are not allowed to derive and draft names for Allah from our own intellect. Okay. And we gave many examples of uh, Allah's uh, attributes, uh, some of his uh, features. For example, he is laysa ka mithlihi shay. There is nothing, nothing like him. And his uh, attributes and his features, they are not limited to human understanding. So let's have a look at the final category of Tawheed. Before we do that, let's have a quick look at the learning objectives for today. Um, so we are going to complete the categories of Tawheed. We will talk about Tawheed al-Ibadah, uh, which is the last category of Tawheed. Uh, then we will continue with the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We'll talk a little bit about Ibrahim's request to Allah to show him how he gives life. Uh, we will talk a little bit about another discussion that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had with um, the people who worship the celestial bodies. And then we will move on to start reviewing some of the great du'as of Ibrahim alayhi salam and understand some of the lessons that we can take from this great prophet of Allah. So moving on to the third category of Tawheed, Tawheed al-Ibadah, the scholars, they mentioned uh, that this is uh, a very important category of Tawheed, okay? Uh, we have firm belief in Allah uh, alone, and then we, we understand that Allah has certain names and attributes which are perfect in their nature. However, that these two categories of Tawheed, which is Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat, they have to be accompanied by Tawheed al-Ibadah, okay? And the scholars, they mentioned that this is the most important category of Tawheed because when we assign our worship, we have to assign our worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to turn to Allah alone without any partners. We see in the case of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was spreading the message of Islam in Mecca al makarramah during this time, um, he um, was calling the idolaters to the oneness of Allah. And what did the idols do? They, they, they believed in Allah, okay? At times they also worshipped Allah, but the difference was they diluted shirk with the worship of Allah. 
So they called upon idols. And when they called upon idols and they were asked that, why do you call upon idols? They gave uh, a similar response to the people at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but they also said uh, this was a, a trait of, of their forefathers that they used to worship idols, but also at the same time, uh, they felt that their honor, their dignity, their um, um, Islamic inclin um, relig religiosity was not uh, as great as it should be. And as a result of this, they are not able to ask from Allah directly. And sometimes we also see this in our Muslim ummah, our Muslim nation. Uh, we'll have common people who will come. Uh, they will ask scholars. They will go to a peer. They will go to a sheikh. And they'll say, sheikh or imam, can you please make dua for me? You're more, you are more closer to Allah. Uh, there are more chances of your dua being accepted. I am not worthy of making dua to Allah. Um, and they request the, the sheikh to make dua on their behalf. So just to clarify, we can ask um, uh, people of faith to make dua on our behalf. However, what is wrong is that we... Um, uh, what is wrong is that we think that we are incapable of raising our hands to Allah. And we mentioned um, in uh, a number of, uh, in fact, I mentioned the Jummah Khutbah on Friday that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is anticipating for the per person to call out and worship him. Okay, worship him and ask from him. Allah will respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls out to Allah. So when we look into uh, the time of uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have a verse here in the Quran in chapter 10, uh, say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who provides for you from the sky and the earth and who owns hearing and sight, uh, they will turn back and they will say it is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So they believed in Allah as the Supreme Lord. However, they diluted um, worship of idols with the worship of Allah. And this took them uh, away from Tawheed. Uh, this took them into paganism. And this is not accepted by Allah. The greatest sin in Islam, the greatest sin in Islam is to associate worship with Allah. Okay? So Allah has created you. Uh, uh, the, the, Allah has created the heavens and the earth. Allah has created us as human beings. We have to dilute, uh, sorry, we have to direct our worship to Allah alone without any partners. So any type of worship, whether it be to a peer or a sheikh or um, a tree or an idol, this is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we mentioned that it is the most important uh, aspect of Tawheed, maintaining uh, the unity of Allah's worship. All forms of worship must be directed only to Allah in the way Allah deserves to be worshipped. Okay, this is very important. So in, in terms of the compulsory acts of worship, uh, we can't change the compulsory acts of worship. If we want to pray one unit of Fajr instead of two, uh, because we're feeling like it one day, this will not be um, accepted by Allah because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has shown us how to worship Allah. Okay, so in response to uh, worshipping Allah, we worship Allah according to the way he wants and according to the way he deserves to be worshipped. If we introduce anything new into the religion, it is known as a bid'ah, it is known as an innovation, and it will not accept, it will not be accepted by Allah. In fact, in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he mentions that the innovation is in the fire. So sometimes we see people they introduce new practices into the religion. They um, introduce new practices into the religion and they start worshipping Allah in different ways. Okay, when you inform these people, is this part of, part of the sunnah? Is this part of um, uh, something that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us? They usually become angry. And the reason they become angry is because they say that uh, this is something good we are doing. So why are you trying to stop us? But um, in Islam, for any act of worship we do, we have to um, back it up with evidence, okay? So this is very important. Let's move on to Ibrahim alayhi salam and him asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, how, um, um, how he gives life. So this is the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he, after he spoke to Nimrud and he said to King Nimrud that um, my Lord is the one who gives life and takes life. My Lord is the one who gives life and takes life. After this, Ibrahim alayhi salam, 
he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, can you show me how you give life? So this is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa idh qala Ibrahim rabbi arini kayfa tuhyi al-mawta qala awalam tu'min qala bala walakin liyatma'inna qalbi qala fakhudh arba'atan min at-tayr fasuruhunna ilayka thumma ij'al ala kulli jabalin minhunna juz'a minhunna juz'an thumma ad'uhunna ya'tinaka sa'ya wa'lam anna Allah 'azizun hakim so ibrahim alayhi salam he asks Allah, Oh Allah, please show me how you give life to the dead. And uh, it's mentioned in the tafsir of this verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Ibrahim alayhi salam that take four birds. Okay, we have a picture of four birds on the screen. Take four birds and commit them to yourself, meaning um, slaughter these birds, okay, remove their feathers, uh, and make, tear them into pieces, mix all of the pieces together, and then place these parts of, uh, these body parts of the birds on different mountains. Some scholars, they say that um, Ibrahim alayhi salam put the uh, bird parts, body parts on four mountains, and some say seven mountains. But here in the Quran, we know that Allah instructed Ibrahim alayhi salam to slaughter the birds, mix up all of their body parts, and then place them on different mountains. And then Ibrahim uh, alayhi salam was instructed by Allah to call out to these birds. So Ibn Abbas mentions that Ibrahim kept the heads of these birds in his hand. Next, Allah commanded Ibrahim, call out to the birds. And he did as Allah commanded him. Ibrahim witnessed the feathers blood and flesh of these birds fly to each other and the parts flew each to their bodies until every bird came back to life and came walking at a fast pace towards Ibrahim so that the example of Ibrahim was witnessing would become more impressive. Each bird came to collect its head from Ibrahim's hand and if Ibrahim gave the bird another head the bird refused to accept it when Ibrahim gave each bird its own head, the head was placed on its body by Allah's leave and Allah's power. And this is why uh, Allah says, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ حكيم. Uh, Allah is almighty and all wise. SubhanAllah. So here we see an example of uh, Allah accepting the request of Ibrahim alayhi salam um, and him asking, um, uh, he, him responding to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, confirming that um, this is how he gives life. Okay, so I'm just going to move through my um, slides. Just bear with me two seconds. Okay, can everybody hear me again? Yeah, okay. So um, just uh, some of the lessons that we learn from, from this story of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, the scholars, they mentioned that he wanted to solidify his knowledge about resurrection by actually witnessing uh, uh, life being given with his eyes. And there's a hadith in Bukhari uh, and Muslim uh, the two authentic hadith, uh, Abu Hurairah, an, he narrates that uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, we are more likely to doubt than Ibrahim when he said, Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Allah said, do you not have faith? Ibrahim said, of course, but rather to put my heart at ease. So here we see that um, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, okay, he um, called out to Allah and he said, show me how you give life. Um, in, in fact, Ibn Abbas, he mentioned that this ayah, okay, is an ayah of hope. Uh, there's a ayah, another ayah of hope in the Quran. Does anybody know uh, what other um, ayah is re referenced? So sometimes we say this is an ayah of hope in the Quran. Um, Ibn Abbas mentions that for him, this ayah uh, where Allah gives life to the death is an ayah of hope. But there's also another ayah uh, of hope, which the scholars discuss. Does anybody know uh, which ayah I'm referencing? Okay.
Okay, so um, you guys may remember uh, the verse of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Qul ya ibadi al-ladhina asrafu ala anfusihim la taqnatu min rahmatillah inna Allah yaghfiru al-dhunuba jami'a inna hu huwa al-ghafur rahim It is in Surah Zumar and in this uh, verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he mentions uh, that um, uh, those of you who have transgressed against Allah, those of you who have transgressed against Allah, um, uh, um, Allah, uh, who have bound, sorry, those of you who have transgressed beyond the limits of Allah, do not despair in the mercy of Allah, Azza wa Jal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins, and Allah is, uh, is Ghafur and Rahim. So here we see that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling people back to him. Anyone who has transgressed, anybody who has done committed uh, so many sins, do not despair of the mercy of Allah because the mercy of Allah actually takes over his anger. There's certain conditions that will attract the mercy of Allah. Uh, so this is an ayah of hope for people who have uh, despaired in the mercy of Allah. Uh, Ibn Abbas mentions that for him, this ayah where Ibrahim alayhi salam asks Allah to show him how he gives life, this is an um, an, an ayah of hope for him. And the Prophet's statement in the hadith uh, where he says, we are more likely to doubt than Ibrahim, um, it means we are more liable to seek certainty, okay? So what we need to understand here, brothers and sisters, is that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had firm conviction in Allah. From a young age, he was given uh, a, a, a pure heart. Uh, he, Allah mentions, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدًا Allah gave him a sound judgment. And he had the knowledge, okay? When Allah asked him, do you not have faith? Allah knew he had faith, but Allah asked him, do you not have faith? Ibrahim said, of course, but rather it is to put my heart at rest, okay? So here we see um, uh, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he had the knowledge of um, uh, Allah giving life to the dead. However, he wanted to witness it with his eye, with his eyes. So this was a request that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had granted to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And also sometimes, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, this is something that we can also call out to um, Allah within our du'as, okay? So, so for example, um, if I take an example of a person who doesn't have any children and they want to make du'a to Allah for a child, this is also... Uh, a way in which you can make dua to Allah. You can call out to Allah, Oh Allah, you are the one who gives life. Uh, please grant me a child. And uh, inshallah, this is one way that you can also call out to Allah. Just as uh, you showed Ibrahim how you give life to the dead, uh, also please uh, um, accept my dua and grant me with a pious um, offspring. Okay, we will move on to the next slide. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam's discussion with the people who worship the celestial bodies. Okay, so um, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, he does migration. Okay, uh, he migrates from uh, the place he was born in Iraq. This was a place where, where the people used to worship idols. Uh, the king was uh, a person who also did not believe in Allah. And we see the many uh, problems that uh, the people were causing Ibrahim alayhi salam in the community. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he decides to migrate for the sake of Allah. Okay, migrating for the sake of Allah is when a person um, is, is migrating from one land to another land. Um, and this is for the, the sole reason is for being able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he was in Mecca, uh, times became difficult for him. Okay, as the persecution rose and people started to oppress the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and also his companions, uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala instructed um, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to leave Mecca and migrate to Medina. In fact, in the Hadith of Bukhari, the first Hadith in Bukhari, uh, it's mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "In the mal'amal bin niyat wa inna ma li kulli mri'im manawa." فَمَنْ كَانَتْ حِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَحِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ حِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَحِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ Okay, the Prophet ﷺ said, the deeds, the, in, the deeds 
uh, depend on the intention of every person. And every person will get the reward according to what he or she intended. So whoever migrated for the sake of Allah and his messenger, then his emigration was for Allah and his messenger. And whoever emigrated for the sake of worldly benefits or for a woman to marry, then his emigration for, was for what he emigrated for. So we see uh, in the case of Ibrahim, he was uh, in a community filled with mis misguidance and uh, he migrated for the sake of Allah. It's mentioned in the Quran actually that um, that the only other person uh, due, due, or the people who believed in Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, during this time uh, and believed in the oneness of Allah was Ibrahim, uh, his uh, nephew Lut alayhi salam, and also his wife uh, Sarah alayhi salam. Okay, so Ibrahim said, I am going to migrate. Uh, to, for the sake of Allah, where, would, where was Ibrahim alayhi salam migrating to? Ibrahim alayhi salam was migrating to uh, Asham, um, um, and there's a number of uh, regions that are included in the definition of Asham. We have Lebanon, we have Philistine, um, and the center of this place is uh, Baytul Maqdis. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he starts to migrate and he passes through a land called Harwan. The people in Harwan, they were people who started to worship the celestial bodies, okay? So they were people who worshiped the star, the sun, and the moon. And um, in Surah An'am, the dialogue is mentioned uh, the, the, that Ibrahim has with these people. So I'm just gonna share a different part of my screen. Just bear with me two seconds. Okay, can everybody see the verses of the Quran that I'm just sharing on the screen? If you can, please just type in yes into the chat screen. So we are gonna look at Surah Al-An'am, chapter six, verse 75. If you can see this, please type in yes into the chat screen. Okay, so here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he talks about um, uh, the discussion that Ibrahim alayhi salam had with the people of the celestial bodies. So Ibrahim say, uh, Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُرِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلِيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُوْقِنِينَ And thus did we show Ibrahim the real of the heavens and the earth, that he would be among the certain in faith. فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَآ كَوْكَبَا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَ قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِنِينَ When the night came and Ibrahim saw a star, he said, this is my Lord, but when it said, when it set, he said, I like not those that disappear. And then uh, when he saw the moon rising, he said, this is my Lord. When it set, he said, um, uh, unless my Lord guides me, I will surely be among the people gone astray. And then when he saw the sun rising, he said, this is my Lord, this is greater. But when it set, he said, oh, my people, indeed, I am free. Uh, from what you associate with Allah. So this discussion that's taking place here, and we can see the translation of the Arabic into English, uh, these um, uh, verses of the Quran, they are referring to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So a question I have for the class, was Ibrahim alayhi salam confused uh, regarding who he should be worshipping? Okay, was Ibrahim, according to these verses of the Quran, was Ibrahim confused about who he should be worshipping and if it's yes why yes and if no why no just a very brief answer and this is why it's important brothers and sisters to understand that there are some verses in the quran which have an apparent meaning and uh, other verses in the quran uh, we have to reference the dalil we have to reference the deeper meaning in the quran so let's see what we have. A lot of no's. Why no? We have no from Muhammad, no from Huda, Huda family, um, no from R to everyone, no from Atiyah, Asiyah, Muhammad, no. Why no? It says here, if we look at the verse and I will highlight it, he said, this is my Lord. Okay, so Ibrahim said, this is my Lord. But when, he's, when it said, he said, I lo like not those that disappear. So was Ibrahim alayhi salam confused? They were revealed to grant him certainty. No, because with everything at the end, he said the reason. Okay, so we, we talked a little bit about 
Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, and we talked about his personality, and part of his personality was that Ibrahim was given a beautiful um, way of um, talking to the people and having a dialogue with the people. Okay, he had this great intellectual ability to speak to the people uh, and uh, give da'wah in a very emphatic manner. So we see when Ibrahim alayhi salam, he gave da'wah to the idol worshippers, uh, he used a means uh, to drive the point home, okay? Constantly, he used to engage with them. Why don't you ask your idols? Why do you worship them if they don't hear you, if they can't protect themselves, if they can't see? Similarly, this was a presentation that Ibrahim alayhi salam was giving to the people who worship the celestial bodies, okay? And this is why sometimes it's very important to um, be careful when trying to understand the verses of the Quran. We should sit in a class of tafsir uh, with a knowledgeable scholar uh, who can give us the, 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 the dalil behind the ayah, the deeper meaning to the ayah or the evidence for the ayah. So uh, some scholars, some mufassirin, they do state that Ibrahim alayhi salam was confused and uh, he was searching for his Lord. However, this is an incorrect uh, view. The most authentic view is that Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, was granted uh, a guidance, okay, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَ from a very young age. And this situation where Ibrahim was discussing with the people who worship the celestial bodies, this came after his discussion with the idols. This came after his discussion with the one who worshipped uh, um, the, the king who tried to uh, show that he can give life and death. And even here in uh, uh, verse number 75, um, Allah says, and thus we did show Ibrahim the realm of the heavens and the earth that he would be among those certain in faith. So this verse comes before uh, this whole presentation that took place between Ibrahim alayhi salam and the people. Uh, also, it is not, not uh, correct that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send um, prophets like Ibrahim alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, and Nuh alayhi salam to the world and uh, uh, show them uh, um, misguidance. Okay, uh, these are people who uh, who, who this, it was part of our fitrah, it's part of their fitrah to worship one Allah alone without any partners, and they were role models for humanity. And even if we look further in the verses, um, uh, verse number 79 Indeed I have turned my face to one who created the heavens and the earth inclining towards truth I am not of those who associate others with Allah So here clearly Ibrahim is discussing with the people and saying I don't associate anything with Allah in worship And even further on in verse 80 He says he argued with his people do you argue with me concerning Allah when he has guided me? And I fear not what you associate with him and will not be harmed unless my Lord should will something. Meaning all of the things that you associate with Allah, all of your wrath and your anger that you have, I don't fear any of it. Why are you arguing with me concerning the sound knowledge, the sound judgment that I have. And then we see the conversation being finished in verse 82. <laughs> they who believe and do not mix their belief with injustice, they will have security and they are rightly guided. And then uh, Allah finishes off the verse 83 that this was our conclusive argument which we gave Ibrahim against his people and Allah chooses who he wants to raise in ranks uh, and degrees. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all wise. So coming back to the uh, presentation, uh, we see here that um, Ibrahim alayhi salam um, was asking uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, um, throughout his life for guidance. And again, in this situation, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam had a very beautiful example. Okay, he showed the people that look, the star is setting, the moon is setting, the sun rises and the sun sets. Okay, this is not my Lord, rather, it is the creation of Allah, and we should turn to the one who has created these, uh, these, these, these signs. Okay, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So this is why we need to understand the verses of the Quran in accordance to the way the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the rightly guided companions understood them. Uh, Anas ibn Malik uh, mentions the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I wish I could meet my brothers." The companions said, "Are we not your brothers?" The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "You are my companions, but my brothers are those who have faith in me 
although they never saw me. So again, uh, this is um, a hadith uh, which is recording in, in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad. And this is also uh, confirming that um, uh, when you see with your own eyes, uh, it, it, it's more profound, okay? So when Ibrahim alayhi salam, he asked Allah to uh, give life, uh, show him how he gives life. Uh, he said, I want to see it with my own eyes. I believe it in my heart, but I just want to um, see it with my own eyes. And we see when a person uh, usually sees, uh, say, for example, a magic trick, which is taking place, okay? They are very shocked when they see it um, in, 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 in real life. Obviously, it, it's a trick of the hand, but they are astounded and they start to believe it um, when they see it with their eyes. So Ibrahim, alayhi salam, when he asked, uh, uh, Allah to show how he gives life uh, this was to confirm um, uh, and make him stronger in terms of um, the arguments that he presented to uh, King Nimrud okay so we have discussed now how Ibrahim alayhi salam he asked Allah to uh, show him how he gives life and we also discussed how Ibrahim alayhi salam um, spoke to the people of the celestial bodies he was given a very, he had a very unique personality which he used to debate with the people. We are going to move on to the du'as of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the du'as of Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, these are very special du'as and inshallah we'll be finishing on this point. So some of the uh, important things that we need to understand regarding Ibrahim alayhi salam before we move on to his du'as. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam was married to um, Sarah, Ibrahim alayhi salam was married to Sarah. How many uh, wives did Ibrahim alayhi salam have? Does anybody know? How many wives did Ibrahim alayhi salam have? Some are saying two, some are saying three. Okay, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had two wives. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had two wives. So after this um, discussion that took place with uh, the, the people who worship the celestial bodies, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he continues his migration to Egypt. And as Ibrahim alayhi salam, he comes into Egypt, um, he, um, there's a king in Egypt and the king is in, informed, the king was actually a tyrant. Uh, the king was uh, informed by a person that uh, there is a, a man in the country at the moment, and he is uh, accompanied by a very charming lady. This hadith is mentioned in Bukhari. Okay, so I'll, I'll narrate the hadith to you. Uh, narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ibrahim did not lie except on three occasions. Ibrahim did not lie except on three occasions. So if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Ibrahim did not lie except on three occasions, are we allowed to call Ibrahim alayhi salam a liar. Okay, I think a majority of the class are answering no, this is correct. Uh, when we address uh, the prophets of Allah, uh, we address them with respect and honor and dignity. Uh, they uh, did things uh, for certain reasons and the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, he mentions in this hadith, uh, twice Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, when he lied, he twice for the sake of Allah. Uh, the first time he lied uh, was when the people said to him, are you coming out to the day of the festival? And he said, Qala inni saqim, I am sick. So the people, they thought that he is physically sick. Uh, he said, I am sick uh, of uh, the way you worship these idols and uh, the reason uh, for, for your worship of these idols. So he was um, in his mind, he said, I am sick. Uh, of the, and he knew his uh, reason behind why he said, I am sick. He was sick of uh, seeing the people worship idols in his community. They thought and understood that he was physically sick. The second um, occasion he said, does anybody know the second reason why? Um, um, or second reason mentioned in the hadith? Okay, the second one was when the people asked him, did you break the idols? Did you break our idols? What was his response? He said, why don't you ask the big one? Okay, so 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says twice for the sake of Allah. The third was while Ibrahim and Sarah were going on a journey, they passed by a tyrant. Someone said to the tyrant, a man, Ibrahim, is accompanied by a very charming lady. So he sent for Ibrahim and asked him about Sarah saying, who is this lady? What was the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Okay, we have some students that have already answered. So the, uh, he said that this is my sister. Okay, and we are all brothers and sisters in Islam. So he said to the king, uh, this is my sister. The reason he said this is that because if he would have said, I am the husband of this lady, uh, the king would have ordered for Ibrahim to be killed. So he said, this is my sister. And then he went to Sarah and he said, look, there are no believers on the face of the earth except you and I. This man has asked me about you and I have told him that you are my sister. So don't contradict my statement. So here we see as well, um, Sarah responds to the king when he asks her, who is this man? She said, this is my brother. And we see here again, um, a discussion taking place between husband and wife. And this is also something that we can take as a lesson that in marriage, we have to respect uh, each other's honor and dignity. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's requesting his wife that look, there are only two of us uh, here in this place. And um, you know, I have told the king that I am your brother. So don't contradict my statement, follow on with the story. So his wife confirms uh, that he is her brother and then uh, the king he tries to reach out um, and, and and do some fahish with uh, Sarah alayhi salam and um, his hand becomes stiff so he tells Sarah can you ask your lord to um, you know um, uh, to um, give me a respite uh, because he was made his arm was made disabled so Sarah she prays to Allah and Allah um, uh, gives him shifa'a and he becomes back to the way he was. Then on a second time, he again reaches out to Sarah uh, salam, and again, his hand becomes disabled. Uh, again, he asks Sarah, can you reach out to your Lord? Can you pray to your Lord and ask him to cure me? Allah cures him. On a third occasion, he tries again to reach out to Sarah salam, and for a third time, his hand becomes disabled. He asks um, Sarah salam, please call out to your Lord uh, to cure me. And for a third time, he is cured. Uh, after the third time, he gets the point uh, that he should not be messing with Sarah alayhi salam. And he feels uh, that the people uh, or the people that mentioned that this is a charming lady, he said to them, you haven't bought me a charming lady, rather you have bought me uh, a Satan. So he instructs his guards to release uh, Sarah and Ibrahim and to try and ward off any evil omen the superstitions that they had at the time, uh, he gave Sarah, what did he give Sarah? He gave Sarah a gift. What was the gift? Does anybody know what the gift was? Okay, he gave Sarah alayhi salam uh, a slave by the name Hajar alayhi salam. And we know that later on uh, in life, Sarah, she gave Hajar alayhi salam to Ibrahim uh, and she said that you can take her as your wife. So Ibrahim alayhi salam throughout his life, uh, he is getting older. He reaches the age of 80 and he still does not have any children. Uh, Ibrahim is, um, is requested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to circumcise himself at the age of 80. Uh, in fact, in the hadith, it's mentioned the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam was circumcised, uh, circumcised himself at 80 years old and he circumcised himself with an, ax, with an axe. Uh, so here we see that this was a command by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. At the age of 80 years old, Allah instructs Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam to fulfill this command of fitrah. And this was done without any anesthetic, without any painkillers. Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam, he continues uh, to listen to Allah, to submit to Allah, and to fulfill the command of Allah. So Ibrahim alayhi salam does not have any children. He marries Hajar alayhi salam, and Hajar now becomes the wife of Ibrahim. Ibrahim alayhi salam is then given, at a very old age, Ibrahim alayhi salam is given the glad tidings of uh, a ghulam, a child. What was the name of this child? So how many children did Ibrahim 
alayhi salam have? And what was the name of the child given to Hajar? Okay, mashaAllah. So from Hajar, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had uh, a young boy called Ismail. And then later on in life, he was also blessed uh, with a child from his first wife, Sarah. And uh, the name was Ishaq. Okay, so these are the two sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail and Ishaq. Then the command of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to uh, migrate with Hajar to Hijaz. Uh, so Ibrahim alayhi salam is now, uh, his, he has a small family. He has his wa first wife, Sarah. He has his second wife, uh, Hajar, and he has his nephew, which is Prophet Lut. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he migrates with his second wife to uh, a place called Hijaz. Uh, Ismail alayhi salam was two years old at the time. Ismail alayhi salam was two years old at the time. And when uh, he migrated to the valley, valley of Mecca, uh, this was a very long journey. Uh, they were coming from uh, Palestine at the time. And when they get to the desert, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he instructs Ibrahim to leave his wife in the desert. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he speaks to his uh, wife and child and he says, I'm going to leave you here. And then he starts to walk away. Um, and subhanAllah, just imagine, brothers and sisters, this is also a lesson that we learn uh, constantly throughout the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that whenever Allah asked Ibrahim alayhi salam to do something, he submitted to the command of Allah. Okay, we just mentioned that Ibrahim alayhi salam circumcised himself at the age of 80 years old. Subhanallah. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam could have given excuses. I'm an old man. You know, how can I, is there any uh, painkillers? Am I going to have any anesthetic? It's too painful. No, Ibrahim alayhi salam, whatever Allah instructed him to do, uh, whether it was family, whether it was circumcising himself, he was ready to fulfill the command of Allah. And uh, um, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, he is instructed, leave your wife and your child in the desert. He starts to turn away from uh, his wife. Imagine the scene, brothers and sisters, okay? No people. It's a barren desert. There's no town. There's no city. There's no civilization. It's just barren land in the heat of the desert. They only have uh, a few uh, belongings with them, maybe some food, some water. And now he is instructed to leave his family in the middle of the desert. Ibrahim alayhi salam, without hesitation, he turns around. Um, and as he is about to go, Hajar alayhi salam, she asks him a question. Are you leaving us here? What was the response of Ibrahim? Are you leaving us here? The first time she asked this question, are you leaving us here? What was the response of Ibrahim? Question to the class. Was it yes, Muhammad? Did he say, yes, I'm leaving you here on the first time she asked him the question? So Aisha says, no response, which is correct. Uh, she asked him for a second time, are you leaving us here? And again, uh, the second time, there was no response from Ibrahim alayhi salam. On a third occasion, she asks a different question. She asks Ibrahim alayhi salam, is this the command of Allah? And this is when Ibrahim alayhi salam, he responds in the affirmative. Subhanallah. So he, when he said this, she said, if this is the command of Allah, Allah will take care of us. And subhanallah, even um, uh, there's another lesson for us here. Uh, is that Ibrahim alayhi salam, no matter how difficult the command, Ibrahim alayhi salam was patient on fulfill, uh, while fulfilling the commands of Allah. And sometimes when we look into the deen, when we look into the sharia, when we have to pray five times a day, uh, we look for excuses on worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, if a person has not prayed uh, for a huge portion of their life and then they start to become a li little bit more sincere and start to worship Allah. Some people, they find it difficult to pray five times a day and we have, uh, unfortunately, brothers and sisters in our community who say that it's not practical to pray five times a day. It's not practi practical to pray five times a day. We have to uh, work. We have to go to work for eight to ten hours. We have to do other chores in our life and uh, we can uh, maybe make up for the prayers at the end of the day. Uh, so realize, brothers and sisters, we may look for excuses 
to worship Allah. We may think that we know better than Allah. And um, time and time again here, we learn from um, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam that whether they understood the wisdom behind the command or not, they submitted to Allah. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Okay, when Allah asked Ibrahim alayhi salam to submit, he said, I have submitted to you. So this is this should be the response of a Muslim when we see uh, when we hear a verse of the Quran when we see a statement of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we should uh, say sami'na wa ata'na we hear and we obey. So uh, Hajar alayhi salam uh, she um, um, was she put her trust in Allah and she said if Allah has commanded you to leave us in the desert Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of us. What did Ibrahim alayhi salam do? He started to walk away from them when he got to a point where his family could not see him anymore. He raised his hands to Allah and he asked, uh, uh, he made dua to Allah. So this is where we come to the point where Ibrahim makes dua uh, for his family. And one of the first duas that Ibrahim alayhi salam made for his family was um, about spirituality. So let's have a quick look at the dua Ibrahim alayhi salam men, uh, mentioned for his family made to Allah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri dhi zara'in inda baytika al-muharram. Oh Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house. At this time, was the Kaaba built at this time when Ibrahim alayhi salam he left um, his family there. Question for the class, was the Kaaba built at this time? The Kaaba was not built, uh, but we understand from this dua that Ibrahim made that this was also a sacred place, okay? Uh, I have, oh Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated, uncultivated valley near your sacred house. So the place was known uh, that it was a sacred place, although the Kaaba was not built at the time. And what's the first thing that Ibrahim alayhi salam he asks for? The first thing that Ibrahim alayhi salam says is Rabbana liyuqimu salah, la ilaha illallah. Okay, in psychology, there's a theory called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Who has studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs at school or college or university? I'm sure many of us have studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, Maslow, in his hierarchy of needs, what he does is he prioritizes behaviors based on need. Okay, um, and this diagram uh, basically uh, picturizes uh, his his theory. So we see right at the bot bottom, uh, the bottom is the core of the pyramid, and we see here uh, physiological needs. Okay, so what uh, Maslow is saying here is that for a person to survive, for a person uh, to uh, survive in, the, in this world, they need some basic things that they need to have to survive. And these are air, water, food, shelter, sleep, uh, clothing, uh, reproduction. And then once these needs have been satisfied, you move on to the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. And as you move up the pyramid, uh, you become more stronger in terms of your resources, your security, your employment, your health, your property. So, for example, once the basic needs have been satisfied, uh, you move forward in terms of your safety needs, uh, your love and belonging needs, your self-esteem uh, needs, and then you get to the status of self-actualization. So, uh, Maslow is basically saying that um, if uh, you don't get all of these uh, needs, uh, you will not leave. Um, reach the level of self-actualization. So here we see at the top of the pyramid, it says desire to become the most that one can be, okay? So uh, this is the desire to become the best of the best of the best, uh, the best according to your potential. You understand your role in life, you understand your goals, your aspirations, you understand your purpose in life. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had a mindset of genius, okay? Ibrahim alayhi salam had a mindset of genius, yes. So somebody said here, the guy who proposed this theory was called Abraham Maslow, but Abraham Maslow unfortunately did not have the intellect of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So uh, we have Ibrahim and we have Abraham Maslow. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, the first thing he asked for was make my family 
uh, people who pray to you. Okay, make my family who uh, people who submit to you. Rabbana liyuqimu salah. Fajal afidat min al nasi tahwi ilayhim warzuqhum min al thamarat laallahum yashkurun. That um, make my family uh, those who pray to you and make the hearts of people inclined towards them and give them uh, food and, and drink so that they may be grateful. La ilaha illallah. What a dua. So here we see, and this also confirms uh, one of the uh, points of Ibrahim alayhi salam being a very good role model and a good parent uh, um, in, in the family. He is worried about spirituality for his family. He is worried about his uh, his. Uh, wife and his son, are they going to continue to be people who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This was more important to Ibrahim alayhi salam than any food, water, shelter, clothing, um, uh, any of these basic needs. The first thing that Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, wanted was spirituality for his family. He wanted his family to be people who worship Allah, who are from the family of La ilaha illallah. And just as a side point, uh, many of our family members, um, for those of you who live in the UK, in the Western world, um, they um, uh, migrated to this country in the late 1990s, right? So, I mean, when I look at my family, they cam came into this country in around 1970. And I think many of uh, your families will have also migrated from different countries to the UK at this time. And at that time, when you ask your family members or if you've been on a trip with your mother and father on memory lane, they will tell you how difficult it was um, um, in this country at the time. There was very few halal shops. Uh, there were hardly any masajid. Uh, they had to really strive hard to earn a day's living uh, and so on and so, so forth. But one of the things that they did not sacrifice uh, is their commitment, their devotion to Allah. In fact, I, my local masjid, uh, I remember uh, some people saying about the community, uh, we have a, a, a large Gujarati Muslim community in, in the place that I come from in Walsall. Uh, a lot of uh, people they say about this community is that these people were people who uh, would rather be hungry, but they wanted to establish a masjid for the worship of Allah. And we see all of the effort that the previous uh, pious predecessors put in to establish uh, a masjid to because of the concern uh, of security and safety of the well-being and iman of the people. Uh, we see today, alhamdulillah, uh, a masjid which is flourishing upon iman. Um, in fact, when I did my hifs uh, in my class, usually in that community, they make sure that there is one son or daughter from the family who is a hafiz of Quran. Uh, so here we see uh, you know, this is a, a great lesson and inshallah we'll finish on this lesson uh, that as parents uh, in Islam, the first thing that we need to focus on uh, for our family is spirituality. Do we want our family to be tied to a generation of failures? Uh, we see in the case of Boris Johnson just in a few uh, um, um, uh, um, decades or uh, centuries, if I can say, I think he was his great grandfather. They mentioned that he was a hafiz of Quran. Uh, so we see how um, things change. Uh, we have to put in all of our efforts to make sure that our children are, gr are grounded in Islam. They understand why they are Muslims. They understand why they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are not Muslims only because their parents are Muslims, but rather they understand the reason why they worship Allah, they understand their purpose in this life, and they work each and every day towards fulfilling this purpose. And inshallah, over the next uh, week, we will talk a little bit more about Ibrahim alayhi salam as a parent. Um, I think this is the uh, last slide, so I will share this dua with you guys. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he mentioned, this is a hadith in Bukhari, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam used to seek refuge with Allah um, for uh, the Prophet ﷺ used to seek refuge with Allah for Al Hassan and Al Hussein. Al Hassan and Al Hussein were the grandsons of the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, say, Your forefather Ibrahim used to seek refuge with Allah for Ismail and Ishaq by reciting the following I seek refuge with you with your perfect words from every devil and from poisonous pests and from every evil, harmful and envious eye. So for those of you who have children, 
you should recite this dua uh, over your children. This is a dua that Ibrahim -Islam made for his children, uh, Ismail and Ishaq. And this is also the dua that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he recited on his grandchildren. Uh, so this is again a great example of another dua of Ibrahim -Islam, seeking protection and safety for his children from an external influence, uh, an external evil influence. And we see this is why Ibrahim -Islam was given the nickname Khalil of Allah, uh, the intimate friend of Allah. Okay, the best friend of Allah. This title was given to two prophets, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Uh, inshallah, we will finish on this point. So we have two more sessions left. Uh, one next week on the 19th of July. Um, uh, this is uh, next week's session is actually the session just before uh, the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah start. So inshallah, we'll talk a little bit about the great importance of uh, importance of the 10 days of the last month of the Islamic calendar. And then we have one final session just before Eid. Uh, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he gives us the ability to act upon uh, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam to give us firm faith and conviction like Ibrahim alayhi salam to submit to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter how difficult they are. Just uh, one final point that came to mind. Uh, one of the scholars was mentioning um, um, a, a, a family accident that took place uh, where he lost his son and his brother. And it was such a horrific accident that uh, took place at the time. Uh, he mentioned that emotionally, uh, he, um, um, you know, he couldn't take it emotionally. So before he said anything, the first words he uttered were, Hasbi Allahu la ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu wa hu rabbul arashil azim wa hasbun Allahu wa ni'man wakil. And this is a, a sign of iman, uh, even when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he lost, lost his son, uh, Ibrahim, uh, this was a very um, sad time. This is a, a, a sad time for any parent to lose a child. No, no, no parent ever thinks that their children are going to die before them. In the case of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was his response? Uh, indeed, the heart is in pain, the eyes will tear, but my, my lips, my tongue will not utter anything which displeases my Lord. And what does this show us? This shows us that, look, it is part of uh, uh, um, our humanity that we will mourn, we will cry uh, and, and feel a sense of sadness for losing our loved ones. However, we don't utter and say anything uh, that will displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Hakim. Uh, he has the perfect wisdom and Allah knows what is best for us on every occasion of our life. Uh, we will end on this point. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us patience and give us the ability to pass any tests that he places upon us. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I did mention um, in a previous session, if we have any new students, um, I do put the um, YouTube um, videos on my YouTube page and I'll be sending out the notes after this session, inshallah, and also the, the Facebook page. So if you guys wanna subscribe or like, uh, you can do that. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.